Before the break of dawn on Friday, last Friday, while Singaporeans were walking up for the last day of work and looking forward to a weekend of merriment, family interaction and rest and echoing the famous refrain, TGIF, Thank God it's Friday, many of you laugh. It was not a laughing experience, not I'm scolding you, but it was painful because it was only just last week. I take it that, I mean, Prema has uh, gone through quite a bit in this uh, process as well over the years, working with families. We all know what it is like. And um, during that, TGIF moment that y'all were laughing, in your name, in your name, a state murder was taking place. I don't have to emphasize that further because I went on live Facebook. You can see it for yourself. If you have not, you can hear it for yourself, loudly and clearly. And in your name, you didn't bother. Some of you bothered. The August panel here bothers, which is why they have done Wonderful work, which I deeply respect. And so, what happened? Ridzwan, 31 years old, was minutes away facing what he dreaded for the past four years, the day of his death. A short while later, Ridzwan, his body was quivering. And I was there, only a few meters away, with some of you who were present, like, um, Jason and um, filmmakers. I think there's only one person who's um, here who was there, which is Jason. And I think uh, one or two death penalty activists were there, like Damien and um, our dearest uh, Kirsten from Second Chances, who have been valiantly fighting over the years. And Priscilla is also here, who has been doing good work. Now, what happened? I was exactly recounting from 5.55 onwards when the execution takes place at 6 a.m. What was the process? Our loved one inside that prison. Can you imagine, just meters away, imagine your child is going through that for whatever reasons that is going through that moment. I don't know how many of you can just sleep, you know, despite me making all this noise. There were 240,000 people and some people still smile at me when I'm talking about this. That's how cruel our society is. Just, I just can't take this place anymore, you know. I just, for this very reason, to fight against the death penalty that I've chosen to leave. If not, I will be in New York. As you can see, my attire is horrible. So anyway, let me continue without digression. So, um, and what happened? Um, his, so Rizwan was, his body was quiver, quivering, had to be physically assisted. You watched that movie, um, Apprentice, right? Many of you watched, have you exactly, it's movie, is it? Can you, not movie, darling, really happening. That's how it's, that, that, that guy got so many awards because why did um, Jun Feng got all the awards? Because the whole, every city he goes to, whether it's Taiwan or whatever, they're horrified what kind of people these people are. You know who they are talking about? You learn, and you don't care. Despite all that online media, despite all that section, let's not go into race, a section of the community that spoke up, 240,000 that watched that video alone Facebook, I was quite surprised. But still, you don't do anything. You don't choose to do anything. How many of you have written letters to your MPs? So, the rope, he stood up the ladder, Watch Apprentice if you're not familiar with what's happening. And went up, the noose was placed around his neck and tightened. His body was now quaking in fear, his heart pounding away in anxiety, his thoughts gripped by fear, whilst he tried to murmur the shahadat, Allahu Akbar. That's the moment you will say, you want to say to God because you're going back to God. Without warning, the trap door below him flung open and Rizwan fell into the abyss, the noose around his neck, tightening until the sheer force snapped his second vertebrae. 
the blood oozing out of his eardrums and his life and all, you know, I mean, all the liquids that's coming out of all the nine holes of the human body and existence squeezed out until his heart stopped. On Friday 19th, 2017, Ridzwan Ali became another statistic. to be presented. A very unwanted statistic. He joined a list of persons, most of whom, like him, were mere drug mules who fell victim to Singapore's draconian death penalty for drug trafficking, which a lot of educated people are supporting death penalty because the poor people who are outside Changi prison, the 240,000 who have watched my video, are the poor and the disadvantaged section of the society. Were they interviewed? I would like to know. How many illiterates, so to speak. Our education system is not that bad, you know. There were a lot of people who have gone through our process, all right? Let me have freedom of expression in the way I want to conduct. So, in memory of Ridzwan, you know I'm trained in court of appeal, eh? They give you 20 minutes, I can still summarize. So not to worry, Madam Chairman. <laughs> or rather, Chairman, no, no, not you, your chairwoman cannot be, I'm talking about him. Okay, <laughs> too much feminist, like you are aware. Okay, anyway, in, let me just uh, take this opportunity, all right? I will spend this one minute of precious time of mine to make a moment of silence in memory of Ridwan and the 900 odd people have been executed in Singapore since 1965 particularly. Distinguished panel, Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends and foo, all alike. <laughs> it's quite different to be standing here or sitting somewhere discussing the pros and cons of the death penalty and all the surveys. I will invite the august members of the family of this panel to visit some of the families and work with us. How you feel at feel about this blood? that the gore that's taking place and the pangs and pain of these families. And I think that, of course, I deeply respect your work, but you know, this whole logic of statistics doesn't really impress me, but definitely the conclusions of your studies have deeply impressed me. Now, so therefore, and in describing Rijwan's execution and others, I'm not here to dramatize or wave the victim's card, rather I'm here to state the facts to say the facts are very, very grim. So I hope despite the very charged and emotional atmosphere of the death penalty, the facts and merits against the death penalty are given the utmost consideration in spite of it. Let me start and not um, bore you with repetition. Um, the death penalty in Singapore was covered earlier by one of the speakers. I will just move on. And I will not, I will, re, re, I will come back to this. This is extremely crucial, not only to the, everything that matters to you. Um, okay, this is, let me debunk the theory of deterrence by Minister, Law Minister Shanmugam. Nothing personal, it so happened that he is the Law Minister. We need to be tough on crime to be safe in Singapore. What an unholy mantra, a holy mantra. Many who argued against the death penalty put a lot of their focus on people who face the death penalty. Not enough attention is put on their victims. Drug trafficking impose immense penalties, including the death penalty on their victims. Thousands of people die from drugs and related crimes. We have stopped that in Singapore, while countries around the world are losing the war on drugs, we want to protect our people from becoming victims and to protect our society, says the law minister. Threat of death penalty for drug trafficking is good deterrent and keeps Singapore safe. You know what? Any child can make this statement. Correct or not? It's so easy. Is this anything scientific? Is this anything philosophical? Is there anything research back? Is this so impressive? A minister who's being paid highest in the world to make the statement and you are impressed by that? We are not. So are all the Bu Jungfeng's countries that's watching this death penalty ritual in Changi are not. 
So therefore, we are really an embarrassment in the world, darling. So what does the General Assembly of the United Nations, which we are part of, we are just one daughter in, in the world. We think we are bigger than China. We think we are bigger than India. And then we go to the General Assembly of the United Nations in 2010. You know what happened? We let the nation, the nations who are opposed, to, who wanted to change, but we, we influence them with all our resources, don't change. And we are along Afghanistan, we are influencing, we are influencing China, we are influencing Iran, we are influencing Iraq. When it comes to the financial capitals, none of them are near you, those who are for death penalty. So, this is United Nations General Assembly, there is no conclusive evidence of the deterrent value of the death penalty. Billions of research have been done to prove this. And one line statement, your minister saying, you believing. Can you imagine what kind of intellectual level that you have stooped yourself to? I'm not scolding you. Huh? Please, people's life matters to me. That's why I'm speaking here. Otherwise, I'll be somewhere else. Now, on Facebook, I can go to jungle, also can talk. Now, Dr. Jeffrey Fagan, a criminologist, and you know what, Dr. Jeffrey Fagan, I had the opportunity of this wonderful, wonderful person to who deposed an affidavit in Yong Wee Kong's case. In 2010, I'm not sure whether you will recall that on the eve of uh, the execution of Yong Wee Kong, I went to court two days before. His mom was pleading, the brother was pulling the neck, and uh, some, I mean, uh, brother was, uh, I mean, like, you know, everyone is like, it was so horrendous. They were pulling my leg as if I'm like a God can help them and so on and so forth. I did whatever I did for three years and with the compassion of so many people that think the law changed. It's not me. It's not just me. It's a lot of people. You know what? It's human compassion, period. And have faith. And Jeffrey Fagan filed an affidavit. Why he filed an affidavit in the Court of Appeal Challenge against a mandatory death sentence? Because one of the constitutional burden the state has to prove it's a constitutional burden. The problem is that our professors, I'm sorry, our university don't go into all these things. Our law school, is, since when law school has ever invited me to speak or exchange to the students? Hardly or barely, all right? I've been invited to 33 countries as I speak five invitations as an international human rights lawyer I get, NUS zero, SMU once, that's it. You spoke to the truth and you are barred from there. And world class university. Le? Ask all your professors to come and debate on constitutional law. Le? Hong Kong renounced capital punishment in 1993 and had no execution since 1966, yet there were no measurable difference. Professor Referee Fagan did a study from Hong Kong and Singapore. He is the leading criminologist. Until today, that survey has been not overturned. What does he say? Hong Kong, majority Chinese population. One of the tigers, as in the parallel economy, but quite a similar situation in Singapore. 1966, the death penalty was abolished for murder because they don't have drug trafficking laws of a death penalty for drug trafficking. And after the, uh, uh, what you call death penalty for murder was abolished, the, the murder rate has been going down. In Singapore, death penalty was, is introduced as a deterrent, right? But the murder rate is also sliding down, actually. But why do you have to need the death penalty? Murder rate going down, right? Both countries. Where's your value for deterrence? Because it's crime of fashion. People get less stress, go psychiatrists, they get less uh, problems. Simple as that. I can finish in three minutes, not to worry. <laughs> I'm trained in court of appeal. <laughs> you see, in Singapore, you know what's the problem or not? Everybody is so focused on time, not the essence. <laughs> Fast, 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 finish everything. Indecent haste, they call that. Like Singapore taxi drivers. The EU holds a principal position against the death penalty and is opposed to the use of capital punishment under any circumstances. The death penalty has not been shown in any way to act as a deterrent crime. Furthermore, any errors inevitably in any legal system. Who said this? European U Parliament. Execution of Jeffrey. Did you care? No. 22nd of April, another brother of mine, Singapore, unlawfully executed. It's unlawfully, yeah? I will take out subsequent applications in various jurisdictions. I, I will spare the statistics because statistics often show that statistics are wrong. I'm a sociologist by training, by the way. So these are all water under the bridge now. Death penalty is disproportionately applied against the poor and disadvantaged. Two minutes, I'll finish my speech, right? Do I have two minutes? Who's the time? Two minutes. He, he shake the head. Don't worry. Don't shake your head. One person. Okay. Two minutes. I'll finish, darling, because I got Facebook Live. Later, I continue. 
death penalty is difficult. Nobody can control me. Don't worry. Game over. Game over. I can continue after a copy. Don't worry. Death penalty is disproportionately applied against the poor and disadvantaged. Look at all these persons. African boy, 18 years old footballer. Blah, 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 blah. Shanmuga Muruge suit. Friday the 13th. That also ritual. Friday the 13th, they hang. Yong Vikong is alive. All this executed, this boy is alive. And by the way, Leong Zien, you followed me to Malaysia, you didn't even follow me, whether you're asking me whether this fellow is executed. You should be, un you follow. La. I'm surprised you're having this kind of question. Then why you follow? Okay. You know, no passion. Eh? Okay, humans. Okay, therefore, I don't have to go to this. Has any kingpin ever been sentenced to death in Singapore? Answer? Yes. Yong Wei Kong's mastermind, correct? What do you mean by no? Yong Wei Kong's mastermind was arrested. His charges, 26, 26 charges were drawn against him. Why did I go? I, I just don't understand this population. The online citizen read so many articles from 2011 to 2012. I took out so many applications, four applications, and yet you didn't even know. There was one kingpin. He's in section 55, not released. As a result of him, many were executed. Do you bother? After this, will you bother? You won't. Your silence is deafening. Because that's what Singaporeans are. What? Now, these are all the reasons. You know what? My slides will be up on my Facebook. You can read. Read this. OK, this one minute it involves all. Abolition of jury trial was abolished in 1969. Our right of silence, basic right, was removed in 1976. Reduction in the number of judges hearing at first death penalty was three. British time warfare, then two, because too much of money have to be sent. Resources have to be spent. Judges have to pay the highest in the world. So therefore, not enough judges. This kind of logic only you can understand. And then, saving costs of judicial procedure at the risk of executing the innocent. Then what happened? Convicted person basing on, alone on convictions. You know what? Some of you laugh. I wish you can be convicted tomorrow for duck trafficking. Your loved ones. No, really. I treat it that way. When you are arrested to the police, Singaporeans don't, clip, don't care. But when you come to lawyer, then you try to understand. Conviction based on uncorroborated evidence. Do you know that there's no need to be uncorroborated evidence in Singapore? Just go to give police statement. Police will bullshit you. You sign, you can be hanged. Bigness, Murthy, case and point. And prosecutorial discretion, they can do anything. They can disregard judiciary. Prosecutors can decide anything. And they've usurped your separation of powers. Therefore, there's nothing. There's no rule of law. This is, they say, what do you know? We are like North Korea. They can do anything they want. Because in the case of uh, the, the death penalty case of Yong Wei Kong and the recent case on Kening, Chief Justice uh, Sundaresh Menon said, if all the countries are also opposed to this law, if only Singapore is not opposed, we will still apply. That means everyone abolished in the world death penalty here. Yeah? We don't abolish. That's the law. So it is like North Korea. With this kind of law, we will take them to International Court of Justice and we will know what to do. It is like genocide because crime against humanity, I can do whatever you want. This is the kind of society that you're living in, you answer. But you know what? I'll continue to live here and then fight. Okay.